Hello, everybody, and welcome back today. We have another, well, not back, back back from a moment ago. You didn't go anywhere, did you? You all came and stuck around to exactly here um, while we jump into another episode of Can of Book Club. I'm so excited. I hope you're super excited. Um, everything should be very exciting. I'm very excited. So let's go get into that room right now and join One moment while I set that all up. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Brand. Boom. We can move it to there. Hey, so welcome to another episode of the Canna Book Club. Um, today we are going to be talking about sex expression, sex manipulation, male to or female and male flowering drama. Uh, our paper today is out of uh, Frontiers in Plant Science. Uh, the authors are Marco Flashman, Mina Slapnik, and and Jana Morovic, probably very different sounding than that. Um, but these folks are out of the university. Oh my goodness, this word. Okay, they're out of Slovenia. <laughs> um, their university department of agronomy. I cannot pronounce that. I'm going to try though. It's like Ljubljana. Lubj Ljubljana. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> And the title is Production of Feminized Seeds of High CBD Cannabis Sativa L by Manipulation of Sex Expression and its Application to Breeding. So this is going to interest anybody in the, anybody that's um, in the business of uh, breeding and, um, you know, that fun issue of male flowers. Uh, I'm just going to jump right into it with the abstract, though. Uh, the use of the cannabis plant as a source of therapeutic compounds is gaining great importance since restrictions on its growth and use are gradually reduced throughout the world. Intensification of medical drug type cannabis production, stimulated breeding activities aimed at developing profiles. The effects of several silver thiosulfate or STS and gibberellic acid, or GA, and colloidal silver were analyzed in this study. Various concentrations were tested within 23 different treatments on two high CBD breeding populations. Our results showed that spraying whole plants with STS once is more efficient than the application of STS on shoot tips while spraying plants with 0.01% GA and intensive cutting is ineffective in stimulating the production of male flowers. Additionally, spraying whole plants with colloidal silver was also shown to be effective in the induction of male flowers on female plants, since it produced up to 379 male flowers per plant. The viability and fertility of the induced male flowers were confirmed by Florich fluorescine diacetate or FDA staining of pollen grains in vitro and in vivo germination tests of pollen counting the number of seeds developed after hybridization and evaluating germination rates of developed seeds finally one established protocol was implemented for crossing selected female plants the cannabinoid profile of the progeny was compared with the profile of the parental population and an improvement in the biochemical profile of the breeding population was confirmed. The progeny had a higher and more uniform total CBD to total THC ratio um, compared to the original population. This is the first comprehensive report on the induction of fertile male flowers on female plants from dioecious medical cannabis. So that's the abstract. Now we're going to talk about male flowers. Um, Molly's going to take it away with the introduction, and we've got uh, Dr. Darren Kaplan with the materials and methods, Dr. Anovis with the discussion, and I'm going to do the results. Take it away, Molly. Thank you, Casey. 
um, yeah, so cannabis is naturally a dioecious plant uh, with a small portion of them being monaceous. Um, and in the past, mostly um, the cannabis has been cultivated for fiber. And now we are after the uh, cannabinoids that it produces for the medicinal purposes. Um, most of them are concentrated in the female flowers of the plant. Um, the most important cannabinoids for pharmaceutical purposes, of course, are CBD and THC. Uh, the percentage of THC is pretty much what divides cannabis genotypes into the two major groups. The first one being the industrial cannabis, uh, which is more known as the fiber uh, type or hemp. Uh, and that means that it has less than 0.2% of THC. Uh, the other one is the drug type cannabis, uh, which is more common to us. And that just means that it has more than 0.2% uh, of THC. Uh, the sex of the plant is genetically determined by uh, one pair of chromosomes, X and Y. The male gender of the dioecious plants is determined by the heterogametic XY chromosomes, while the dioecious female plants and hermaphrodite plants have uh, homogametic chromosomes, XX. Uh, the ratio of female to male flowers in a single monaceous plant is highly variable and could be mostly male flowers or mostly female. So there isn't really um, a one trend in this. Uh, more than that, dioecious plants can produce flower of the opposite sex as determined by their sex chromosomes. Um, due to the instability in sexual phenotypes across the monaceous plants, it was hypothesized that sex expression is a polygenic trait, which means that it's influenced by more than one gene. Uh, the first map and study of sex determination um, in 2016 uh, sorry, was done uh, with three biparental hemp populations. Two of them were dioecious and one was monaceous. They were using 71 amplified fragment length polymorphism markers. And pretty much that's a PCR-based technique where they're using selective amplification of some digested DNA fragments to generate and compare their unique fingerprints for the genomes they're looking for. And so they identified five quantitative trait loci associated with sex expressions, and those were located on sex chromosomes. Uh, Petit and colleagues uh, published results of genome-wide association study analysis for the um, characterization of the genetic architecture uh, underpinning sex determination in hemp plants. Uh, the findings there confirmed previous reports that several factors, such as uh, sex determining genes, sex chromosomes, epigenetic control by DNA methylation and microRNAs, as well as physiological regulation with heterohormones, uh, influence sex expression of predetermined cannabis plants. So there are several studies with um, hormonal manipulation um, that confirm gender reversal in cannabis and also proved the uh, bipotency of sexually predetermined dioecious plants. It's also been shown that uh, gibberellins induce uh, maleness in plants, while ethylene, uh, cytokinins and auxins, they stimulate the formation of female buds on the genetically male plants. Uh, Galoche also showed that indole 3 acetic acid, IAA uh, kinetin, which is, has been used uh, up to 100 microgram per plant, and ethylene releasing compound ethyl, which was also used up to 100 microgram per plant, those have enhanced feminization of male plants. Uh, there's also uh, abscisic acid, which is ABA. Uh, interestingly, it was uh, ineffective for both male and female hemp uh, when used alone. The GA3, which was also used um, up to 100 microgram per plant, that promoted uh, masculinization of female plants. However, it had no effects on sex change in the male plants. Uh, Raman and uh, Jaiswell found that male plants showed no change in sex expression when treated with gibberellins but female plants develop normal stamens and viable pollen grains. Um, so besides several environmental factors um, can also have an effect on the sex expression. Uh, those factors include temperature, photo period, light conditions, nutrient deficiency, as well as mechanical stress. And so all of them can induce monasticism, which is also the hermaphroditism that uh, we commonly refer to as growers. Uh, cannabis sex can also be modified by applying exogenous growth regulators or chemicals. It can influence, and influence the ratio of endogenous hormones, and as a result, it can incidence of sex organs. Um, and also, I would really um, suggest you guys read through this part, but um, there are silver compounds like silver nitrate or silver uh, thiosulfate that have been found to have masculine effects in many plant-specific um, in many plants, but specifically, uh, it was also including cannabis. Both of those silver compounds uh, successfully evoke the formation of male flowers, 
but the um, silver thiosulfate had more effective uh, effectiveness than the silver nitrate. Uh, there are a few studies cited here. I definitely suggest, suggest you guys check it out. There are uh, very specific application rates that they're citing. Um, and I think um, if anyone is interested, it's you know better look at the proper rates. Um, the manipulation of sex expression has paramount importance in breeding medical cannabis since only female plants are used in commercial production. That enables self-pollination and crossing of female plants for obtaining pure lines and feminized seeds. Um, upon germination, the feminized seeds produce female plants that are used for flower production, and most studies on sex manipulation so far have been done on the fiber type, uh, type hemp, um, and the knowledge about the efficiency of similar methods in medical cannabis is still much needed. Um, so the aim of today's study was to test different manipulation methods for induction of male flowers on female plants of medical cannabis, as well as to evaluate the efficiency based on the number of male inflorescences and flowers by evaluating the pollen viability, germination potential in vitro and in vivo, and uh, seed set. And uh, in addition, um, the selected treatment in this study was implemented in a breeding program for crossing a population of female plants of high CBD medical cannabis to verify the usefulness of such treatments for the entire industry. And um, on that, I'm concluding the introduction and uh, Darren, you can take it away with materials and methods. Thanks so much, Molly. Uh, that was great. So this is a pretty a dense paper. Uh, it covers a lot and uh, it's, it was very well done. Uh, so it's out of the U University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. And um, the objective, like Molly said, was to determine how to best trigger male flower formation on female cannabis plants for the purposes of breeding. That's kind of my summarized uh, objective because they, they did do a lot. But yeah, how to basically produce male flowers on, on female cannabis plants. Uh, they looked at a few different exogenous substances. So these are hormones like silver, silver thiosulfate, STS, gibberellic acid, uh, GA, and colloidal silver. And they looked at a few other physical manipulations that uh, the growers that they work with uh, deemed as common practice. So they did a lot uh, of kind of what, there's a lot of this going on in the industry, a lot of different treatments that people are using to um, create hermaphroditic or male flowers on uh, on female plants, but it hasn't really been standardized. Uh, so this is a great approach. They're using two uh, breeding populations of CBD, uh, CBD genetics, uh, MXCBD11 and MXCBD707 are the names. Uh, and it, notably, they're they're not necessarily using clones. That they they use um, they have a a breeding population. So seeds from similar that would be similar but they're not genetically identical like they would be if they were clones so this is interesting uh can, we can talk more about this as a group because i'm curious to hear everyone's input on this but they could have used clones which means that they would have potentially tighter statistics that they, they, there's con controlling for more of the genetic variables but the fact that they didn't also says that and, and they still found interesting results in the end kind of shows that maybe the results will carry over multiple genetics rather than just on you know, two clonal varieties. So I think it's it's interesting they did it this way, uh, not not a criticism. So it was 23 treatments overall, which is a lot, and they did that over two experiments. Uh, in the first experiment, they applied uh, two rates of STS, silver thiosulfate, to uh, the whole plant. They applied three rates of STS to the shoot tip, so that's... Um, five treatments right there. Another treatment was to spray an entire plant, entire plants with gibberellic acid at 0.01%. Uh, and then they applied a intensive kind of cutting stress treatment of cutting the plant down to the height of two nodes, uh, I guess, right when they were uh, initiating flowering. So when they cut the photo period down to 12, 12, and all of these were applied at that, that point when they, when they cut the photo period down after uh, I think it was 30 days something like 30 days in veg. Uh, so that was that that experiment was kind of more specific to the treatments themselves. And I think what they were trying to figure out was before they go on to the next experiment, which they would they did some additional treatments on like some pre treatments, which kind of would work better uh, to give them a better idea of kind of where what direction to take. In the second experiment, they also applied several growth regulators. So STS again, um, 
and um, and colloidal silver additionally in this one. But all of those treatments were applied after an initial pretreatment. So they applied uh, three pretreatments, and that was after 60 days of veg in this case. So the pretreatments mostly were around how much light and dark they received for a week before they applied their secondary treatments. Uh, the first was to apply one week of constant light before triggering the plants and before applying the treatments. The next was to apply one week of constant dark. Uh, and the last was a control where they put them under standard photo period of 18 on, six off, so standard veg photo period. Um, and then they applied uh, one of four secondary treatments. And the four secondary treatments were either uh, an application of colloidal silver, uh, either once once at the at the time of trigger or every day until the male flower showed up. Uh, and then another treatment there was a whole plant application of STS, silver thiosulfate. And finally, they had a control of no treatment. So there was a, it's a factorial. So they had a, every combination of those two pretreatments and secondary treatments. So that's where you get the 26 because all of this was factorial. So this kind of adds up. In terms of uh, measurements, so what they were looking at were some of the standard growth measurements that, that are taken in most studies, so plant height, number of nodes, uh, more related to breeding and, and male flower formation. They looked at the number of inflorescences per plant. So that's uh, inflorescences, often we'll see that term in, in publications. That's the, the, um, the, I guess, the correct term for like a bud. Uh, it's a, kind of like a, a bunch of little flowers is what makes up a bud that's called infl an inflorescence. So the number of inflorescences per plant and how many of those inflorescences had male flowers. And they also looked at the number of male flowers per plant total. Uh, they also went on to look at the viability of the pollen and the seeds that were produced through these practices. They, went, they, they had a, a fairly technical method for doing that. I won't get into it, but um, it, I think it's a pretty standard method for checking the viability of pollen and, and seed germination. And lastly, they looked at uh, something that I found quite interesting is kind of the usefulness of their approach. So they picked what I think was the most effective treatment and they went through the entire process. It was um, to apply uh, for the treatment. It was to apply the daily colloidal silver up until a male flower showed up. And they compared those to cuts that were taken from the original mothers that had not undergone any treatments um, and so the idea here was to see whether or not the cannabinoid content uh, would change between ones that had undergone the treatment and were selected based on consistency of cannabinoid content compared to the original mothers. And they, grow, they grew them side by side uh, under the same conditions. And in the, in the end, they looked at the uh, cannabinoid content of the inflorescences between the two. And that uh, summarizes the materials and methods. So let's go Excellent. on to the next the results. <laughs> Thanks, Darren. No problem. Oh man, this is a pretty cool setup. I love it. All right, let's do some results. There is a lot to cover here. I'm just gonna kind of try to run through it as best as possible. Um, so they kind of broke it into two experiments. Um, so going over experiment one first, the silver thiosulfate negatively affects the growth of plants and morphology. So <laughs> they basically are saying in their first treatment of <laughs> uh, silver, they sprayed it with 20 millimoles of um, the silver thiosulfate and they got yellow spots. Um, basically, it just um, did not work out very well with a lot of silver. Um, you can kind of see the pictures in figure 1B. Uh, there's some yellow spots on those leaves. Um, and I mean, they, they're they breaking it down. Every application has different concentrations of silver. And basically, the less silver, the kind of less physiological responses they got. Um, the higher amount of silver applied to the shoot tip, the more severe effect it had to the morphology and fitness. Um, male inflorescences began to appear three weeks after treating female plants. Uh, male flowers began to open four weeks after treating the plants and pollen began to spread. 
And you can see in figure 1C, we've got a male inflorescence opened up, ready to pollinate. Um, on the plants from the gibberellic acid and the cutting method and the control, only a few male flowers were observed. Plants from all treatments developed female flowers as well. No hermaphrodite flowers, which is pistillate flowers, also containing anthers, basically a female flower with male bits. Um, none of that was observed. Looking at the different treatments induced the formation of male flowers on female plants. <clears throat> the, so the breeding population and the treatment had a statistically significant influence on the ratio of the plant heights, the ratio of the number of nodes, number of inflorescences, and number of male inflorescences with um, only one exception. Um, and all of that is on table. things. Let's see, I think they're going to mention actually. Um, yeah, so treatment had no influence on the height ratio, uh, despite the fact that the cut plants exhibited the least growth. The differences among treatments are more pronounced for the number of inflorescences with male flowers, where spraying with 20 millimoles of STS stimulated the development of the highest number of male inflorescences, followed by 0.7 millimoles and that and the application of 50 micrograms of silver on the shoot tip. Yeah, so between the two breeding populations, the MX CBD 707 had a higher ratio of height and um, the inflorescences. And in the treatments, down to the 4 to 100 micrograms of STS had a, one of the higher number of inflorescences. But yeah, definitely all these tables are pretty extensive. So uh, if interested, definitely pull that up and check out all those specific results. Um, gonna jump over to the number of male flowers was influenced by the interaction effect between both factors. So like, yeah, it gets really complicated because Dar Darren was explaining how they um, stacked different interactions. So the highest number of male flowers for both breeding populations was observed after treatments one and two followed by treatments three, four, five. So basically sprayed with 20 and 0.7 micromoles uh, or millimoles of STS, followed by um, 50, 100, and 150 micrograms of uh, silver on the shoot tip. Uh, basically in all of the eight tested treatments, the CBD-11 developed higher number of male flowers compared to the 707. Uh, that's in figure two. Does that show it? Oh, in figure one. Yeah, so figure two's got a nice bar graph. You can see that every time the CBD-707 outperformed in um, the number of flowers, and you can see the gibberellic acid, the cut, and the control basically had very little number of male flowers. Moving on to the second experiment. So colloidal silver induced formation of fertile male flowers on female plants. Um, in the second experiment, the effect of different pretreatments, um, oh, this is actually what we were mentioning where they stacked everything. Um, they looked at the different pretreatments. Uh, pretreatment as well as treatment had a st statistically significant influence on the number of male flowers, but their interaction was not observed. Uh, you can check this out on table four. Um, the, yeah, you can see the pretreatments and treatments. Um, the lower amount of silver with the 12 hour, 12 hour light dark. Looks like it had the higher number of male flowers per plant. Uh, in contrast to spraying of 0.3 micromole of, or min, <laughs> millimole, sorry, of silver, 
uh, which induces male flowering after only one application, the colloidal silver had to be sprayed every day until the formation of male flowers and yielded an average of 293 flowers per plant. Uh, and it was neg negligible if it was only sprayed once. Um, if, and that's all on table four and table five. Table five is a doozy. It's got um, all of those different pretreatments, treatments, and then you can see the number of male flowers per plant and the percentage of pollen cells germinated in vitro. Okay, now then they're going into the pollen successfully ger germinated in vitro and in vivo. The in vitro germination tests show that the induced male flowers produced viable pollen um, that is able to germinate in vitro on solidified germination medium. That's kind of cool. I like this. Um, in order to verify the ability of pollen to fertilize the females, the pollen was collected and used for pollination of different shoots of one control. Um, two weeks after pollination, the number of developing feminized seeds was counted, and that's on table six and figure 1H. Then they are going into the breeding. Um, so the analysis of cannabinoid profile uh, revealed that 48 plants of the CBD 707 contained between uh, like three and a half percent to 11.7 percent and then the for that's CBD and then for THC they were 0.41 to 9.9 percent uh, but then to kind of we did all out <laughs> they only selected 23 plants with the ratios above 13 these mother plants were cloned, um, induced to produce male flowers by spraying them with uh, 30 ppm colloidal silver every day, and then they were able to cross-pollinate in a contained flowering chamber. Uh, basically, a 64.3% germination rate was recorded. And that's the basics of this, uh, the results of this paper. Um, Go ahead and take it away, Dr. Anna, with the pre-discussion, I guess we'll call it. <laughs> the pre-discussion, okay. Also called the discussion in the paper. Um, oh my God, when I went into this paper and looked at the materials and methods, I was like, oh my God, this is so complex. But reading the discussion, oh my gosh, this was actually a very good study and they found some really amazing results. So this is different from, um, other papers that have been published because it's on um, uh, not hemp. Lots of lots of studies have been done on hemp, but um, or not lots. I don't want to say lots, but this was not done on hemp. So this is what makes it different um, and very important because uh, we know that being able to self fertilize, self pollinate um, is really important for producing feminized seed, which is very important to this industry. So that's why this study is so cool. Um, we know that ethylene is a plant hormone that's involved in sex expression and it's an antagonist, which means that it interferes with the expression, um, which allows the female plant to, uh, to express male structure. So produce pollen, structures, um, which we can then use female pollen to pollinate female um, uh, flowers and get female seeds. They are going to be all female, and they, and they did actually confirm that in this study. Um, so they were very successful in this study with using um, STS and colloidal silver as antagonists. Um, I did have, uh, just because it's on the next page, but figure three was really confusing to me, and maybe we can discuss this. Um, it was the ratio of TCBD and TTHC in 48 mother plants. Anyway, we'll talk about that after, but I just wanted to throw that in there so we don't forget. Um, but silver thiosulfate was more efficient than silver nitrate, um, potentially because it is transported throughout the plant more efficiently. So that makes a lot of sense. 
Um, we do know related to male flowers produced on female plants. So that's good to know. Um, Nation is not just related to the sex chromosomes. There are a lot more genes that are uh, influencing sex expression in cannabis than just the sex chromosomes alone, which is good to know. Um, I see a lot of conversations that are centered around sex chromosomes, but it's you know there's a lot of there's there's hormones and stressors which they address all of those things in this. Well, not all of them. Some of these things in this paper, which was I thought was fantastic. Um, I was surprised that they didn't do a light stress test. They did a cutting test, which was good. But um, a lot of conversations I see with uh, female plants producing male structures is centered around light leak. So I was surprised that they didn't include that in this paper, or perhaps they tried doing that experiment and it didn't work, so they didn't include it. I don't know. Um, but um, okay, so here in the rest of the discussion, they kind of compare their study to other studies that have been done and what they found versus other studies. So Ram and Set in 1982 uh, applied STS to the shoot tips of cannabis plants, and they they found they they created a lot of damage. Um, these researchers did not observe the same damage that the that the researchers uh, uh, Ram and Set observed in 1982, um, and uh, they also didn't. They didn't also. Okay, so Rhett and Sam were applying um, just to shoot tips, and they uh, saw a lot of damage. Um, but these researchers also did a whole plant uh, application, and it seemed to work a lot better. So that's good to know. Um, they did observe a higher amount of male flowers per plant compared to the study from 1982. But again, this is, that these are two different kinds of cannabis plants. The study in 1982 was done on hemp plants that were um, chosen for fiber, uh, and this is on like medical cannabis. So these are different kinds of strains. So it's kind of like the difference between if you're gonna treat like wild mustard and broccoli. Um, you're gonna see some differences, which was super interesting. Um, so they found that, uh, or, or, or they, 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 what do I wanna say? They, um, hypothesized that perhaps these differences could be due to the, the different um, strains and what they were chosen for, um, how they applied the STS to the plant, so whole versus shoe tip, and the, the strain differences, which we, we know is a factor in um, all kinds of different applications of all kinds of things, light treatments, nutrients, and things like that. Um, the next thing they, the next study that they reference is Lubell and Brand, which is interesting because I just listened to Lubell um, do a, it was a webinar today, and Lubell and Brand are actually a married couple out of, of the University of Connecticut. Um, she's studying masculinization, inbreeding, and polyploidy in cannabis. Um, she's a very interesting lady, and her research is really interesting. Um, they didn't they did they did a similar study but they didn't actually count male flowers um but they um they kind of estimated that about 85 percent of inflorescences had male flowers in the study whereas in this study only about 55 percent of their flowers um contain male male parts so lubelle was more successful in her sts treatment um but she also says that some strains she tested for, one of them was very successful in producing male flowers, whereas the other ones weren't as prolific 
in producing the male flowers. So it does matter which which strains you're going to uh, induce the male flowers on. Some some are great at it, some are not. Um, and then Molterni et al. 2004 also tested this in European hemp varieties and found that different um, hemp varieties exhibit different stages of resistance to sex reversion treatment. So some don't mind being sex reversed and some do. Then <clears throat> they found the same thing. They, between the two strains that they were testing, they did find a difference in the two strains. So that gives a, a little bit more credibility portability is a little bit more about robustness to um, this assumption that strain matters. Um, they do exhibit um, manipulation differently. They compared pollen. And so pollen from just a basic male, like a, a regular male plant is different from feminized um, pollen. It's the, the, the morphology is different. There's a lot more weird and wacky shapes and sizes. And the, uh, the, the, the regular male pollen is, is supposed to be carried by wind, whereas female pollen is generally more sticky and it kind of stays a local. And they did observe this and other studies have observed this too. Um, I just have in my notes that Lubell uh, described it as <laughs> sticky and dumb. Um, and when there's no males to compete, like who, it doesn't really matter uh, because you're just going to pollinate whatever's around. So basically, what they found is that STS works in terms of reversing the sex and, and creating male pollen structures on a female plant. Uh, gibberellin. Uh, gibberellic acid was not very good at doing this, and cutting also was not very successful in producing male structures on a female plant. Um, again, I was surprised that light wasn't one of the treatments, but this, they did enough. Um, <laughs> um, they did mention in, in the last portion of the discussion that some male flowers appeared on the control plants, which was unexpected. However, um, there could have been some sort of spillover from when they were spraying the STS on their their treatment plants that maybe some STS landed on these control plants and, and did have some sort of effect. Um, but I think more probable is that all cannabis has the potential to produce male pollen structures if she so sees fit. <laughs> Um, there was a study done by Poonja and Holmes. Actually, we covered this exact paper in episode four of our um, Canna Book Club. Um, male flowers can form spontaneously on up to 10% of female plants. So it's not crazy that they did see male structures forming on some of their control plants without any sort of treatment. Um, and then their last section, they do mention that all of their offspring were female, double X chromosomes, fully female. Um, there was no Y chromosome present. Um, what I thought was really interesting in this paragraph is that was, there was a significant improvement of uh, CBD THC ratio um, with a CBD content of 29.58% measured in a plant with a THC as low as 0.82%. That is, to me, fucking crazy. And if I am reading this wrong, please let me know when we have the discussion, because that is insane. Um, and so then their last paragraph, or their last sentence, sort of goes into that cropping plant selected. Based on their chemotype profile, improves the genetic constitution of the breeding population and consequently um, enables the development of new varieties with improved cannabinoid profiles. 
Yeah, okay. Um, I would love to see the COAs or know the lab they went through or if it was an internal lab or where they got those results from because that is absolutely, those are absolutely insane numbers to me. And then the final conclusion, um, the induction of fertile male flowers on female plants with medical cannabis, um, that this is the first study that they know of. This is directly related to medical cannabis. There's some other studies, but they're all in hemp. Um, they mentioned the other previous reports of gender manipulation from their other studies that they mentioned. Um, but methods for medical cannabis have been shared among growers for years, right? Um, and the information was not obtained. So this is basically a study that's giving scientific rigor to the grow science um, that everybody knows and loves. Uh, and this is kind of my passion is, is taking all these things that people do in the cannabis industry and have been doing for so long and doing it scientifically to show what's going on they got there and why it is how it is. Um, so I'll get off my soapbox now and we can have a discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for that number, uh, Anna, because it's, yeah, you're right. I didn't, I didn't, that didn't um, jump out at me, the 24% CBD. I've never even heard of that. But it, I, yeah, I think that they did report that for, that for one of their seeds. to me because, I mean, 0.82% THC, I mean, that's over, that's, that's definitely over the, the 0.3, mm -hmm. but oh my god like that's a very high cbd number it, i i would assume it for me i would expect you know well over one or two percent THC with that kind of cbd level yeah if they were harvested a little bit earlier they, they would still be incredibly high yeah. thc and yeah and i mean cbd with not much thc it's great but they probably just found something very unique in this trial and are not making a big deal about it but uh well, they, we'll see what comes <laughs> I, and, and then I feel like this ties back into the graph that I don't understand. Yeah, we can get um, into that. Yeah. The figure three. Mm -hmm. um, because it would be really great if we could, you know, figure out how to make a very high producing CBD plant that also comes very low. Because my general, uh, you know, rule of thumb is if you're hitting 8% CBD, it's time to harvest because you're going to go over that point three. Mm. Yeah. But if we can get. 15, you know, percent and still hit 0.3, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Yeah, or 20 even maybe. That's that's cool oh, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah uh so figure three i so i think what they're looking at my understanding at least was they're trying to see if they can have a more consistent ratio uh of thc to cbd within progeny from the same from the same seed lot i guess so what i think they measured they, they took um, they took cuts from uh, the original mom, and then they looked at the uh, cannabinoid analysis of those inflorescences when they flowered them, and then they they did that selective process to find more consistent um, cannabinoid profiles that they were looking for, and then looked at the ratio again. So effectively, I think it's just looking, they're trying to reduce the variability in ratio, because I think it plays into what you're saying. If the rate, if the ratio of the progeny is is quite different. It's hard to find that cutoff uh, of the of the THC if you're producing CBD. But if it's tighter, then you could probably get higher without hitting that, uh, without testing hot. So I think it's just trying to bring that kind of the those bands down between the ratios. Does that seem right? I, I mean, I guess I guess I don't. I just don't understand the graph. Like the blue is 48 mother plants. So that's the ratio of CBD to THC. So there's a very large, I, I'm sorry, I, I need to talk through this to like try yeah, to Yeah, let's talk through so it. There's a very large <laughs> range. Um, and to me, a ratio is not like a, I don't know how they're graphing this. It's the, so the ratio would be like, THC to CBD, so uh, a bigger ratio would be more uh, CBD, I guess. Sorry, uh, yeah, more CBD, so CBD, THC. Yeah, so it's just, 
I guess it's showing that of those from those 48 mother plants, the the progeny had more variability in their in the ratio between uh, T, the CBD to THC than the ones that went and, through this the breeding process. And the progeny has a tighter. Yeah, so they're more similar to each other, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so but there's a bigger deviation also with the error bars. Right? Yeah, how are how are they express? That's a good point. I know. So, I'm like, I'm so confused by this graph. Like, and I don't. To me, a ratio is like two to three, or thirty to one, or mm -hmm. and I don't know how they're graphing this. I just don't. It's mm -hmm. I can't wrap my head around it. So. Yeah, it's not super. Ideas. It's not super super useful. <laughs> and they don't even say like, is this percentage of CBD or case? Is it? Is it? Like they don't. I don't know. They just don't. I'm very confused. If you can't tell. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I don't think it's it's super useful in this trial. And the and the, and the perspective of everything else they've done, it's one of the the, the lesser important <laughs> points. But I love I love box and whisker pots, and I really want to understand <laughs> it. But like my comments on this is just what the fuck. I but it's okay. We don't need to spend any more time on it. I just very it was very confusing. Definitely, it goes to show that selection is powerful. <laughs> not not well, I mean, artificial selection at least. <laughs> mm -hmm. Gosh, it's, plants are so crazy. Like, what the heck? Um, I don't know why I never really like investigated it before. Like the whole feminized seed process, <laughs> but it all just kind of like came to me during this paper of how you've got a female plant that somehow pops up make decides to make pollen and can like cross itself and ma magically make female only plants it's just those x chromosomes um yeah so, so much to say but go for it today i learned something super interesting today actually from one of the researchers that is mentioned in this paper um dr labelle branch is married to Doctor, anyway, um, I did not know this, but variegation, you guys know, if, if you know me or follow me, like I love the freaks and the mutants and variegation is like one of my passions, especially since so many people like go, oh, it's tobacco mosaic brush. And I'm like, no, it's just variegation. So variegation is a homozygous recessive trait. And in a non-stable seed line if you have variegation that pops up in your plants which we did in several plants this year it indicates a non-stable line like i was blown away by that i don't know if that relates to this paper or not but i just want to let you know variegation is a thing and there are a lot of people that are um creating you know breeding and but they're not starting with stable lines and so their offspring are in, exhibiting um, more of like an F2 generation than an F1 gen. An F1 generation would be super stable looking um, as far as phenotype goes, but they're exhibiting m multiple phenotypes because, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that made any sense, but I was like super excited to find out about this variegation thing that keeps popping up everywhere. Yeah, I, I get that a lot too. Oh, so much fear of tobacco mosaic, but you're right. Yeah, I didn't realize that was the case that that it that it showed up as kind of non -homo, hom like homozygous plants, but not homozygous, um, not gen genetically consistent plants. But uh, that's really cool. It's cool you found that. I was excited. Mm -hmm. Did Did you want to go talk about the light stress a little bit? I would love to. Okay, yeah, I was so try to look back into that. Too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, looking at the ex second experiment, so part of the second experiment was this um, these pretreatments, right? So the the treatments were done before initiating uh, flower, which you, you're right, Anna. That yeah, you, know, you think that maybe you would try and do it during flowering to trigger some kind of stress. But I wonder if it, it was done for a week. Um, 
a week after being under normal vegetative photo period. So I think that they are effectively light stress treatments, these free treatments. So like have being them, putting them under a week of darkness or a week of constant light, I think th that's what they were trying to get at was to was to um, try and use that to 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 trigger male flowers. But I don't know if they found much from that. So then were they doubling up on on treatment? Yeah, it was a factorial. So they were doing uh, the three pre-treatments and then they were crossing that with the treatments of SDS and colloidal silver uh, applied in different ways. Because they did the cutting stress, which I understood yeah, that. that. And I don't know why they didn't do just like a control kind of situation, but with like a light leak. You know? Yeah, well, they kind of did. So they would have, if you look at, I guess, and if you look at table two, variant nine would, or be variant nine? No, it would be variant 13. So 13 would be a week, they had a week of light, constant light, and then it was a control. So there was no other treatment applied afterwards. So that's okay. effectively like a light leak. But they don't really, I didn't get too much into the results or discussion. I don't know if they mentioned how effective any of these crosses were or were not. Uh, it didn't okay. seem like that was kind of one of the main findings. So maybe that's why. <laughs> so they skipped over it. it was yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I just wish they simulated a bit of a more like realistic light leak situation. Mm -hmm. It's usually, that, I don't know, yeah. either a hole or it's, you know, somebody opening the door or you open your box. So it would be cool if or somebody um, forgot to turn the light off. Or yeah, like exactly. Night. Mm -hmm. So that would be really interesting if it's like small interruptions yeah. of like the dark cycle. Um, even if, let's say, in the middle of their dark night, would be 15 minutes of light right in the middle of it. Would that make any difference? Mm -hmm. would be pretty interesting I agree. Do, do you guys have much experience with that? So, like, from my experience at least, is when you get a light leak, you, often you'll see you'll have, or just like the photo period gets messed up. You'll have, you can have reversion back to a vegetative stage, and that well, I've noticed that it stunts growth, and it you get some kind of wonky flower growth, uh, but eventually it goes back to vegetative growth in most cases if you kind of leave it consistent. But I, I've seen a, maybe a little bit more male flower production from that, but I don't nothing consistent or that I would say like use as a tool to produce male flowers from, from my perspective. I've seen more of like accidental I guess situations where you know, it's just sort of, um, we've noticed some, it would be like, there was this one case, it was pretty interesting where we had a full room of, you know, female plants and uh, we had one plant that had all female branches, but one. So there was one branch that one plant out of like a couple of thousands that had, that had entirely branch full of male <laughs> sacs. Um, and it was a pretty interesting location, kind of isolated in the back of the room. So, uh, we didn't really know for sure if it was that, but there was kind of like an observation of having like a hole in the wall later on. So that possibly could have contributed. Um, and revetch, yeah, I've seen that happen too, but uh, revetch just takes a bit longer. And most of the time in the commercial production, like if it's in a flower room, they won't have time to basically make it go back to veg and wait a bit so that, you know, it, it's able to uh, form proper uh, buds. So that I haven't seen, I guess, like on a bigger scale, but definitely seen like multiple times where something is causing the, um, I guess, like the reversion. And then there was one time where the only flowers in the entire room that have been affected by having both female and male flowers were uh, near the door. And um, there is a possibility that because sometimes they would open the door in the middle of the dark cycle just to sort of check that the lights are off. Maybe that was a contribution. But again, you know, these are sort of hypotheses. And if you kind of have to like replicate this um, to really make sure. So. Hmm, that's, yeah, it's really interesting. Did anybody from the audience have any questions or discussion points? Just wanted to check in.
Hello, everybody. This is Tori. I made it. Tori. I just, uh, yeah, just Tori. made it. Traffic was a little crazy. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment uh, just on two things about the paper that I noticed. Uh, number one, I don't know if you guys talked about that gnarly CBD ratio, of like some ridiculous percentage uh, that kind of stood out to me. And then the second thing was, uh, yeah, just Molly talking about the um, kind of one male stem out of there. That was one of the most confusing things I've ever seen. Um, I've been doing more like research into it over the last couple of years. And it's just very interesting how, you know, since we're really turning into like a monoculture with cannabis, you know, it seems like, I don't know. The long and the short of it is that there's other operations around the world that have male plants in their gardens and it doesn't, you know, quote unquote, poison the gardens. Everything runs fine. Uh, you know, everything seems a little bit more stable. So I think that there might be some sort of like um, survival mechanism happening with some of these plants, uh, possibly where we can't really explain why they're going through this interesting uh, change. But I do, you know, I do think I'm hypothesizing, of course, but I think it's really a little bit more yeah, to stress and feeling a little bit lonely, which I know sounds it is what it is, but again, you know, my uh, my plant foundation came from wholehearted people, so that's what I always default to. And so, I don't know. I think there's something to having just a lack of males in the garden. Can't attribute to anything, you know, serious at this point in time, but I've just noticed that we're definitely some of the only operations like North America that doesn't do that. So, um, yeah, that's just kind of my commentary from the paper. And again, apologies for not being here, but family calls so much love everybody good to see you all i'm complete corey 100 percent. like i feel the same way when we are depriving these females who their whole purpose in life is to reproduce and make a seed so they can pass on their genes to the next generation and they're not able to do that and they have the ability to create a seed on their own they're going to do that and i feel like as we keep starving these female plants from being around males, we're going to see more and more seed um, just showing up um, for no particular reason. And we can't explain, well, we can't explain it. Um, but yeah, no, I feel the same way you do, Corey. And yeah, that CBD thing at the end where it's like, uh, uh, what was it? 29.5. 8 percent CBD and as low as 0.82 percent THC. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that's yeah. fucking crazy. Yeah, like what? I mean, I think the highest that I had was a like had a med relief cultivar, um, Trutiva. I think it was. I think we had like it was like 16 to 18 percent CBD, and like that stuff was just like that is a gnarly medicine. Let me tell you, I wasn't even ready for those effects. Uh, and I wish I could share that one before, but, uh, yeah, that was kind of the highest ratio that I was aware of before. And that's, yeah. Like what? I don't know. It has to be well, wrong. I not, don't know. It's not compliant as, uh, you know, it's not compliant as a hemp, uh, with that high of a THC, but that's a very low THC for that high of a CBD, uh, percentage. Yeah, I'm I'm a fan. That that sounds like actual medicine. I'd be totally down with that call to our. So. Me too. We're gonna make our way to Slovenia and try it out. Okay, you book the tickets, Darren. I'll pay you back. <laughs> you know, guys, I would be really interested if we can get a hold of. Um, the breeding studies uh, that were done during Soviet Union and the Ukrainian Institute of Agriculture, I think, because they definitely had a lot of um, papers on their cross selection, how they were able to maintain their varieties that have been mass produced uh, back in the day. So that would be pretty cool. I'm going to try to see if uh, I can fetch that in English. That'd be super cool. Love to see that. Yeah. Oh man, so many things that I have like so many questions now with breeding and and, and uh, sex manipulation. Um, 
glad we kind of came back to this topic. Uh, I think our next topic is going to be trichomes, or was it terpenes? I guess terpenes come from trichomes, so maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> Um, so definitely come back next week or check us out on YouTube and all the things to continue talking about cannabis science with the Cannabis Book Club. And uh, shameless quick plug there on the that last episode that we released for Resonate Radio, uh, Dr. Darren Kaplan is on there with Tad Hussey. So uh, go out to uh, your favorite podcasting platform for resonate radio and if you want to hear dr kaplan tad hussey and uh, myself talk about the horticultural divide you know kind of the uh, interesting worlds of how cannabis and large-scale egg large-scale horticulture have kind of been clashing uh, definitely recommend it so shameless plug for us over here at resonate radio and dr kaplan i know darren you're probably not going to say anything so that's my job i will scream from the loudest mountain for you brother <laughs> thank you listen to it So yeah, <clears throat> that's freaking hilarious. So uh, I'll unmute now. My daughter ran full on in the glass door. I wish you guys were able to see Dash hear that because no mic, no video, but that was funny. She's fine. Um, guess somebody closed the door on her, but we're, we're doing well. Um, we have another... You can hear me now, right? I, I, I suspect that you can. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hello. There we go. Um, so they have another Chad Westport in 30 minutes happening right away. Don't miss out on that. Um, go eat because you might need to do that if you haven't done that already. Otherwise, keep it growing. Um, I'll be checking out the, the Chad show right after this. Um, yeah, I'm excited for uh, another busy day. So without any further ado... We'll shut it down and be back here. Like, don't even do much. Like, you don't even need to go far. You maybe make yourself some noodles really quick. You can do a few. I, I don't know. Like, but be back here because Chad's here. And, you know, that's a good time. And I'm going to be back here. So you should be back here. And we should all just come back. We'll just come back here in shortly. Okay? Everybody, cheers. Have a wonderful day. And, and, and you know, wish for the rain to stop in Vancouver. It's getting kind of bad. But anyways, ciao, guys.